Welcome to The Youth Voice, a podcast giving young people across the island of Ireland a voice in politics. Today we're joined by Minister for Infrastructure and Deputy Leader of the SDLP, Nicola Mallon. So thank you for joining us, Minister. No problem, Dermot, at all. So uh, I suppose we'll get straight into it. One of the big things that's on the agenda for young people at the minute is the idea of votes at 16. In Wales, it's been brought in for the, the local assembly elections and it's something that a lot of young people really want to see, both north and south of the border in Ireland. So what's the SDLP position on that? The SDLP very firmly believes and has for a very long time that we should be lowering the voting age to 16. Uh, we expect people in our society who are aged 16 to step up on so many fronts, uh, and yet we deny them the right to vote and to have a say in who is being elected to take decisions that affect their lives and their futures. So we very much believe that from the age of 16 onwards, people should have the right to vote. Absolutely. And as well, one of the other things that I suppose I'm quite for myself is, I suppose, an improved political education in schools. In school, you can you can study A-level politics or GCSE politics. Some schools offer it, however, many don't. And as well, you're not you are you're focused a lot on, I suppose, the the procedure of how it, it all works. But it's not mandatory. You're you have quite low, I suppose, quotas of the amount of people who go. Very few people take it up in a lot of schools. So I was wondering, would the SDLP support, I suppose, a mandatory, I suppose, course or something in schools from possibly in first or second year? Obviously not in primary school, but in secondary school, just so possibly it might increase the vo- the amount of people turning out to vote and I suppose actually get people involved in politics. I think, Dermot, that probably one of the biggest challenges is that when you talk to somebody about politics, particularly a young person, you say the word politics, they're just completely switched off. You know, it's either what does that mean? That's irrelevant to me or it's toxic. Right. So for me, politics is about the interactions between human beings. It's about the interplay of power. It's about influence. It's actually about how we kind of function as a society. Um, And so, for example, you know, my brother, when we were growing up, we weren't really interested in politics. But when I started studying it, because I did it for a level, you know, I would have said to my brother about it, for example. And he was like, what's that about? And I said, like, even who holds the remote control in a house. Right. That's politics. Okay, so I think our challenge is not to make a politics class mandatory because people would just hate that you're being forced to do something you don't want to do. So maybe that's not the best way of doing it. But what if we just had a proper conversation about, you know, the way resources are allocated in our society, have a conversation, whatever your age, about why some people who are born into affluent families get an easier run generally in life than others. You know, why is it right that in some parts of Belfast, for example, like in North Belfast, where I live, the life expectancy is lower than in places and parts of South Belfast, which is just a few miles from here. So I think it's about how do we have that proper engagement? And my big thing is how do we involve everybody in discussions about the type of society that we want and the kind of future that we want? And then the important part of that is not just discussing it, but what are you going to do to help achieve it? What am I going to do to help achieve it? You know, because we all have a stake in this. I think that's probably the better approach than maybe just making the class mandatory. But it's not, there's no easy way or a template for being able to do that. It's about just having those open and honest conversations everywhere and involving everybody. Absolutely. I think it has, it, it has to be, we have to do what suits young people, I suppose, in this kind of situation. And I suppose both kind of moving on from that, but with, Young people have a very low voter turnout in the North, the 18 to 22, I think it showed that in the 2011 election, we only had something like 51% of people between 18 and 22 voting. I think part of it is, to me, is the idea of mandatory coalition. I think a lot of it stems from the two big parties. They're always going to get in for ever since, I suppose it was bar the one time when the SDLP and UUP were in power. It's always been the Shinners and the DUP have always held control. It's always been the same kind of infighting for the past 20 years or so. Do you think that it is time and do you think we're ready as a society to move away from that mandatory coalition and into, I suppose, normalised politics? Well, I suppose then kind of we're having a conversation about the Good Friday Agreement 
And, you know, I know that there are people who say, and I can understand why they say that the mandatory coalition isn't working and so forth. First of all, I haven't heard anybody come up with a better alternative. Um, Second of all, I don't think it's essentially the structures that are the problem. I think it's the culture and the parties. Okay, so I think that that's where the real um, difficulties are. I think that young people are switched off um, because they don't hear politicians talking about the issues that really matter to them or resonate with them. And we still get this bickering uh, and this rowing and some people still engage in this kind of orange and green politics to push people into their tribal trenches. So I can understand why a lot of young people um, switch off. But if you look now, we have had the COVID crisis and that's had a huge impact on our young people, their education, their ability to engage with their mates, their mental health and well-being. We've got Brexit, which is denying young people huge opportunities. I just think it's outrageous. So there are a lot of things right now that I think young people should be getting engaged with and going out to exercise their vote. It's so easy, and I understand why so many people think, what is the point in voting? You're always going to get the same, you know, you're going to get the same two big parties, the same cycle of politics, the same bitterness and all of this. But that's not true. If everybody came out to vote, things would fundamentally transform and change. And I suppose that's the biggest battle to win in the first place. It's about saying to young people, every single vote counts. There's been elections here where a seat has been lost by four or five votes, you know, demonstrating that literally every vote counts. So I think it's about telling people and particularly our young people, empowering them to realize if you come out and vote, you can transform things. You can transform the political landscape. You will certainly transform the issues of politicians and parties are focused on and where they're putting money and resource into. Absolutely. I think we are, I th- as young people we've kind of just been we're we're almost neglected in the sense that you know we have all of these issues that we're told we should be interested in rather than what we are actually like whenever a big campaign was you know same-sex marriage and that was something that young people were really behind and then it was just you know oh you can't have it because one community doesn't like it so I think I think things like that is what also pushes young people away it's oh we can fight and we can fight we can fight and then they're gonna just they're just gonna use a petition of concern, or they're gonna use a cross community voting mechanism or some kind of way to screw us out of whatever we want, rather than what you know what society wants. It's just kind of a oh, well one party wants it and they'll get an independent or they'll get the TUV or somebody like that to back them up. So and and that's the thing. It's all about disempowerment. You see, if you tell someone that they can't possibly change something, right? You sap the life out of them. They're not going to get up and vote. The other way of doing it is when you get really energized and enthused about a campaign like same-sex marriage, and then it's just blocked, right? That's anti-democratic, but it's also a way of disempowering young people. And again, it's the way of kind of switching them off from politics and switching them off from the power of their vote. So it kind of takes a bit of grit and determination to keep charging through that. And the more people it do, the more times we'll break through all of these barriers and we'll get the change that we really need. Absolutely. And I suppose another big issue, I suppose, at the moment is it's the fallout of the Brexit agreement. The DUP and the UUP want to trigger this Article 16, which some of us know what it is, but a lot of people, it's a lot of it's confusing, even to me. And I love politics, but a lot of it's, uh, you know, it's it's a mess. Uh, what do you think for the North is, I suppose, the best approach now? Like, how can we make the most of Brexit? We're out. But what is what is the best move now since we're out? Well, I, I think that some people need to stop talking nonsense you know, and distracting. So this conversation around Article 16, it's not a quick fix at all. So it's not really honest to be telling people that you can just trigger this and we're all going to go back to the way things were before because that's not true. You know, the SDLP were opposed to Brexit. We were the only party to campaign against Brexit. We think it's wrong. There's no good Brexit. We're in a situation now and we have to implement the protocol. Um, But we need to be able to maximise the opportunities of the situation that we're in. And there are huge challenges, but there's also some opportunities to be had. And I recently spoke, um, it was just after Christmas, on the Brexit debate. It was around kind of the the deal. And we were very clear that we needed to get the Assembly to withhold their consent, just as the Scottish Assembly had done and the Welsh Assembly um, as well. 
But at that, what I'd said was that I make no apologies for saying this. The SDLP is resoundingly pro European. We have been from John Hume's time. We believe that it's good for the for the values of our society, for peacekeeping. We've also benefited hugely economically from our membership of the European Union. So we are campaigning to get back in. Now we can get back in in one of two ways. Just logically, we can go in because there will be another referendum within the UK. And the young people who are being denied their vote at the moment will be voting in that referendum and they will vote to be part of Europe again. Or you can re-enter membership of the European Union uh, through um, Ireland as a what as a uniform political entity, you know. So those are the two logical pathways to it. Um, and I do believe that we need to be back at the heart of Europe. And so we, me, my SDLP colleagues, that's what we are going to continue to campaign for. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think we are just running out of time. I know today was a bit of a shorter episode, but thank you so much for coming on, Minister. Thank you, Derek. Uh, you're, you were a first SDLP person on, so I think now that means we've had all of the big five now. So thank you very much for coming on. Thank Great. you, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you all next week. Great.